Hi, everybody. Good evening. We're going to get started. Hopefully everybody can hear, hear us on Zoom. Um, if you can hear me on Zoom and hopefully you'll be able to kind of see us too. Um, if you could put in the chat for us, if you can hear me, okay, that would be great. Judy, can you see if um, everyone can hear us? Is anybody putting in the in the chat? Okay, we see thumbs up, so we're doing good. So, <clears throat> hi everybody, welcome to Big Valley Beekeepers Guild. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. The reason we're using the microphones is because we do have some folks on Zoom with us. And so everybody do a quick wave at the camera. Hi. <laughs> um, and so this allows us to also record the meeting, hopefully the audio as well as the camera, so we can then post it. And um, so we really appreciate um, your patience with us. Hopefully you can all hear me okay, though, because we don't have speakers in the room working. We found when we tested it earlier, there was some delay. So we're just going to use the microphone really just for the folks that are in Zoom. So um, anybody here here for the first time tonight? Oh, welcome. Okay. okay, well, Jim, I know Jim too. <laughs> so um, I'll do some quick introductions. My name is Cherie. Um, I'm one of the directors of the Big Valley Beekeepers Guild. We also have, um, we have Judy in the back. There we go. Hi, Judy. Uh, we normally, we also have Paul and Mark who couldn't be with us tonight. And then we also have our brand new uh, board of directors, director, Bill. There we go, Bill Verdick. <laughs> so welcome, Bill. Um, so definitely stay after the meeting tonight, chit chat with, with us, ask questions, because this is your chance to network with others um, that are also interested in beekeeping. So just some logistics and housekeeping. Um, there is a restroom in the back here. If you go around the corner, there's also a, restra a restroom through the restaurant in the back. Make sure that your wait, your server gives you a ticket, you know, for your meal tonight um, so that you can pay for that and um, make sure you pay for it um, either with them or at the front desk before you leave. Uh, we usually, if we meet here at the restaurant, we meet, try to meet at about 5.30. There's a no host dinner. Then we try to start promptly at 6.30 and then go from there. So, and we'll try to wrap up by 7.45 or eight o'clock tonight too. Um, Judy, you got it? Is it working? Oh no, okay, hold on. He tried. Yep, is it not working? Okay, all right. Try click, maybe try clicking, like use the mouse to click on the, the white screen and then, um, and then, and then try the arrow key. There you go. Click once and then and then use the arrow key. Oh, there we go. Yay. <laughs> Sometimes the, the technical stuff. Um, so we have some updates. Go ahead, next one. All right. So um we are recruiting for directors and waiting. And so if you're interested in being a part of the Big Valley Beekeepers Guild and the board and the direction that we go in. By all means, talk to one of us. We have direct, what is a directors in waiting, right? What is that? It means that you kind of follow around the directors, right? You might attend some of the board meetings. Um, you're instrumental in helping, you know, learn about the guild before you actually take on a director role. So it gives you a chance to kind of shadow and, and to get involved. Uh, we do need volunteers for the remainder of the year. We have two volunteer coordinators. We have Barbara. Yay! And we have Laura, who recently joined to help Barbara. So raise your hand, Laura. There we go. Yay! <laughs> So if you're interested in helping out, please see one of them because we have a couple of th cool things coming up this year. So one is we are going to do an entry into the Lodi Great Festival. We are going to do a beekeeper scarecrow. We're gonna enter the scarecrow contest. <laughs> so we're so excited. So, so um, oh my gosh, Moy. <laughs> Moy, raise your hand, Moy. She is one of our educator co-chairs. She's going to be heading up getting that scarecrow put together. So she needs people to join in with her to help her design the scarecrow, figure out how to get it to stand up and what the design is going to be. And what we're thinking of is, you know, a scarecrow in obviously a beekeeper suit with one of our t-shirts, maybe with a hive and, and a couple of other things. And so to have on display at the great festival. And that will give us some really fun exposure in the community. And I think it would be really fun with their theme. So 
make sure you see her before you go because she's going to need some some help with that. We also are um, planning hopefully a field trip to uh, BZBs um, in Esparto, which is a huge commercial operation. We did a field trip with them last year. We're going to try and do that again this year in September. So watch for that. And then all of you who are harvesting honey this year, we are actually going to have a honey tasting contest in November. So that's when members will get a chance to enter their honey. We will have ribbons and we'll have a tasting contest. And then what's even better is we're having Cindy from Cheese Central in downtown Lodi. She's actually going to come and teach us about pairing cheeses with honey. So that is our plan. So for November, so make sure you have that. And then of course, for December is our annual Christmas party. Um, I think Barbara and Laura and our educator uh, educational chairs are going to be working on that with us too, to kind of get that plan. So lots and lots of opportunities for everyone to get involved and, and have some fun. Um, if you'd like to sponsor a meeting, it's only $20 and that sponsors our Zoom fee. So if you, if you want to do that, you can definitely do that online at our website. Okay. Um, if you have not yet joined this year, if you join for 2023, you actually get a member pin. So how many of how many of you already have joined and haven't gotten your pins yet? Anybody? Oh, okay. So make sure you see Judy um, or Barbara or Laura or um, Moit right there <laughs> after the meeting. <laughs> so, and then you can get your pin. So that was our a very cool um, member gift for this year. So we still have a couple of t-shirts available. Um, Rosalyn was able to help us with those last year. We'll probably be, we'll get, be getting ready to do a new t-shirt coming up, um, but check those out. Sorry, I keep pointing at Judy and she, <laughs> there we go. Keep going, keep going. And then we have this awesome cool thing, patches. So if you wanted to have a Big Valley Beekeepers Guild patch for your bee suit, you can get one. <laughs> And they're right there. They're only $10. And, um, and oh my gosh, it's the greatest way to show off for your friends that you belong to Big Valley Beekeepers Guild. So with that, we're going to um, introduce our guest speaker tonight. Um, and I believe he's brought some uh, covert tasting at the end. So if you'd like to, so we have to kind of keep it on the lowdown, but for the folks that are on Zoom, I'm so sorry. This is why you come in person if you can. <laughs> um, but so after the meeting, make sure you come on over and, and he might be able to give you a little taste of what he has been able to produce. Um, but just a little bit about Jim. So Jim has been keeping bees since 1995. Um, he's actually a retired IT professional, but now he's a full-time bee enthusiast and he's actually working through the same program that I went through with the UC Davis uh, Master Beekeepers. Um, he's at the journey level and he's currently the El Dorado Beekeepers president, which is our, who we call it, is our sister club. So he made the drive all the way down for us today, which is really cool. Um, he is working on his capstone project for camp, which is the, the UC Davis Master Beekeeper program. And he is also a partner in a bee related business called Sierra Foothill Honey Collective. And he manages there, they manage about 50 hives. So Jim has um, just been learning and growing in his beekeeping journey. I know a lot of times we always talk to him about Randy Oliver because he worked with Randy Oliver for a while. And um, he's a, just a huge resource. So we're really happy to have him. And he is going to talk to us specifically about making mead with your own honey. So even if you don't quite have your honey yet, you know, maybe you're, this is your first year, you'll get, have an idea of what you need to get for the next year, right? To maybe be able to make mead because you'll be at the point where you'll have so much honey, you won't know what to do with it. <laughs> or maybe you hoard it like I do. I, I tend to not really, we have too much honey I need to find a home for. So um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and introduce um, Jim. And Jim, will you, Jim, welcome. <laughs> yeah. So part of our uh, December holiday uh, holiday party is. Uh, um, making mead. So we made a batch of mead last December, and that's what we're having in our silent auction for our 
August summer social. So if you guys come up, there's four bottles of, of, of mead that we made it at that last winter social. Um, so we have a lot of other neat swag too. It'll be fun. I'll see you there. And let's see. At the clicker? Yes. We will go. Oh, oh yeah, he's doing it. Okay. Maybe it was me. Oh. Uh, is it on? There we go. I'm always turning these things off because the batteries go out. Let's see. Ooh. Oh. This way. Next. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. I'll go set. back to the, okay. all right. So. Okay. I will, I'll throw out some light banner while we're waiting for <laughs> confirmation. Um, I'm just going to show you, since you guys have all got tremendous honey harvests this year, and it's bigger than any year you've had in the past. We're, we'll show you how to make uh, mead with some of that surplus honey. And it's really very simple. Um, you may think that you need industrial scale equipment. You don't. You might think you need a lot of fermenting knowledge. You don't. It's like gravity. It's gonna, gonna happen if you put the right ingredients together. So I am going to check and make sure we're all okay. Okay, we're good. So, uh, um, Make sure that advances. I'm just gonna reach over and tap the button. Okay, so some people will say, you know, what is mead? They've never heard of that before. Maybe they haven't been watching Game of Thrones or they're not, you know, uh, Northern ancestry. They think of Vikings with a horn of, of mead in the mead halls partying. So mead is just uh, is an alcoholic beverage, and it's just made from water, yeast, and honey. And there's a lot of little variations on that recipe. Add some uh, fruit, it becomes a melamel. They call it a melamel. Uh, add some apples, it becomes a sizer. But there are many, many variations to mead. But in its basic form, uh, honey, yeast, and water, they have, it's called traditional mead. So you'll see it in contests it, under that category. That's all it is. And there's a lot of variation in the taste of mead just from the honey. So um, it's been consumed forever. It's probably the oldest alcoholic beverage known to man. And it's not just uh, in the Northern tradition. Egyptians did it fermented mead and were very good fermenters of mead as long as far back as the northern peoples it's just an ancient drink so you know many people say it's uh, it's like honey you know it's very healthy for you eating pollen might be very healthful healthy for you um i don't think there's any really studies to it's kind of a folklore but um the origins of things like honeymoon. So it, it's imputed to have extra extra power for the newlyweds. So they, they consumed it at varying schedules after the wedding day up until that first full moon, the honeymoon, or they consumed it on the honeymoon. So it may have had it. I don't know if we've had any scientific studies on it, but it might have magical powers to, to help that out. So, um, so it, we're going to ferment and the fuel for fermentation is the sugar in the honey. So the more sugar in that honey you know, or that composition, the more potential alcohol you can derive. So uh, the chemists in the room, they're probably like, you know, my, my equation's balanced. They'll say, ah, oh, yeah fermentation. 
but that's basically it. You have a fuel, sugar is the fuel. Um, the yeast is gonna consume that sugar and its byproducts will be ethanol and some carbon dioxide. Um, and there's a few other minor amounts of, of gases. And this, this happens in an anaerobic in, for environment. So the yeast uh, doesn't like to oxygen. We don't like os oxygen in there because it, other organisms can multiply and you might have uh, some wonky tasting mead because it's got some stray yeast bacteria or something. Um, in ancient times, they did, you know, the Vikings, they'd throw it in a bucket, the ingredients, garlic, um, throw it in a bucket, let it ferment. And if it was a little wonky, that's where the fruit, the fruit came in later to conceal some of those imperfections. So um, the environment, the environment we're going to have is anaerobic and it's, you know, there's a nice window, 67 degrees. 60 to 70 degrees. You can find a, a interior room in your house, you know, that's kind of stable. That's a good sweet spot for uh, fermentation because if it gets too cold, it'll stop. You know, when it gets too hot, it'll uh, go real vigorously and maybe uh, quit fermenting before um, you want it to stop. So basically, uh, this reaction, as long as there's sugar in the mixture, it's gonna, yeast's gonna keep on consuming it. This reaction is gonna keep going on until it runs out of sugar. And that's the end point. And happily, we've got a uh, instrument and I'll go over this a little more, but it's called a hydrometer. This never lies. So if you're, uh, I know I've, I've said a few times, I've had bottles exploded in my wine rack that's because I didn't allow fermentation to totally complete. So this, this uh, will measure the specific gravity in the fluid and it has a scale on it. This one actually has three scales. Um, it'll tell you the percentage of alcohol, the potential. So you'll do this right in the beginning. You'll make your mixture, drop it in, give it a little spin, see where it settles and it'll tell you uh, 15 and a half, 15 percent. As fermentation goes by, and you'll, you know, you'll see this in the air gap, and I'll show you what one of those is. But you'll be eating your popcorn, watching this bubbling, waiting for it to finish bubbling, and eventually it'll stop, or come very close to stopping, and it should be very near zero on the hydrometer when it does. When it's zero, you're done. You can seal it up it won't explode on you, hopefully. So I'm just gonna put that down. Um, so the ingredients you need, you know, water, honey, and this is where your tremendous harvest comes into play because the general recipe that I use, three pounds per, uh, per gallon. So three pounds of honey for a one gallon carboy. That's a lot of honey. So mead takes a lot of honey, takes a lot of sugar to get metabolized and turn into alcohol. But that's no problem for you guys because you guys, you know, you all have 300 pounds of honey laying around this spring, summer. Uh, you will also need a yeast. And there's a lot of science in yeasts, but um, the yeast is going to go into that honey water mixture, start that reaction, the fermentation reaction that we just saw. And it's going to hopefully metabolize all of that and finish up exactly as the scale shows you on the hydrometer, like at 15 and half percent. So for myself, and I'll send this around because this is um, Lavalin D47. There are several makers of yeast. This uh, white wine yeast, I think is a great beginning option. And that's what I've used 
um, we'll have a few tastes of the final product, but um, that's what I use pretty much all the time. So you can use yeast that will, a champagne yeast that will potentially uh, give you a higher finishing alcohol percentage, um, champagne yeast, potentially 18. And that will produce a very dry mead. Uh, it's like a Chardonnay, you know, your face will implode because it's uh, so dry. Um, but this is the product I like to use. And I'll send this, I'm just gonna show you for the folks online. Lavalin D47. The champagne yeast is EC1118. And if you just search for Lavalin champagne yeast, you could find that too. It's good to experiment with different things. Um, the optional uh, piece that I like to throw in is this uh, Fermaid. You could just add a, a dash of that in your uh, mixture. And it's just a, a yeast nutrient. So in the very beginning, this yeast, uh, it's been uh, dried out and you put it in water, stir it up in a bowl and it'll start bubbling a little and pitch that. It's like, you know, like you do your bread. So the nutrient just gets it, uh, gives it a boost, the yeast population, a big boost, creates an extra nutritious environment. It gets them fermenting really fast. So it'll speed the, speed the reaction up. Um, so those are the basic ingredients. And then um, you can add pretty much anything you want. You can go online and find zillions of variations of recipes. Um, with fruit, with apples, different juices. Um, I've had some with jalapeno, which was really pretty interesting. Um, so the hardware, I'm going to show you all these pieces. So we know the, we know our three ingredients. We have uh, the material and you'll need hardware. So everything on this table, um, is really inexpensive, my view, and uh, easy to get off of Amazon. We have siphon pumps, like I talked about, uh, the carboy. It's just your vessel you're going to create your anaerobic environment in. So glass is really good. It's easy to sterilize, um, but I've seen people do it in plastic buckets. You know, anything that the, you can fit an air gap on, you can use to ferment in. Um, I was telling somebody about a uh, meadery in Hawaii. You, you walk in their showroom and they have 250 gallon totes, you know, like you get your uh, high fructose corn syrup in um, to feed, but they will be fermenting in 250 gallon totes. So anything you can sterilize, um, you could ferment in, you could find an air gap to fit on. So uh, the one gallons are good if you're just experimenting with a batch, you wanna see how it turns out before you start going into larger carboys, like that's a three gallon. I usually don't use, use very many of those and the five gallons, probably the other most popular size. So you get um, almost five bottles of, of meat out of one of these. And I think it's like 34 out of the five gallons. So that's kind of like the yield you can expect. So on the carboy, I have an airlock. So you just think of your P-trap in your, uh, under your sink, you know, you'll fill this with water. So it allows the expanding CO2. Remember that's a byproduct from the equation. It allows the expanding CO2 to bubble up through the the P-trap go out in the atmosphere, but doesn't allow air to come back in. So we're keeping that um, environment anaerobic and there's different styles of them, but basically all, they all work the same. I'll send, uh, I'll send, let me send this one around along with the, the Lavalin, but um, you will need an air trap. Those are really, uh, cheap and easy to come by. Amazon, you get all this stuff. And it's just to keep your environment anaerobic. 
um, hydrometer, we talked about that a little before, measures that specific gravity of the fluid. This is how we take the reading at the beginning and at the end. So in the beginning, it'll tell you what your percentage of, of potential alcohol is. And at the end, it'll t if it's at zero, then you can feel you don't see a bubble coming through the airlock. You know, you're waiting. Oh, nope, no, that wasn't one. Ah, yeah. Then you can be sure it's finished and it won't explode on you in your wine rack. Okay. And let's see, and a siphon pump. You can use this, you know, it's a really cheap one. Um, get your siphon, uh, your suction. Use this for two things. We'll do a process we call racking. So you'll go through 30 days of, of, of um, fermentation. Your little uh, air gap's gonna be bubbling like crazy, but you'll notice at the bottom, there starts to be a buildup of dead yeast. There'll be a little sediment layer and it's all those, all those yeast creatures that have worked their whole life to give you alcohol. And perished. So they'll be a, 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 a little layer of sediment at the bottom. So what we can do with clarity is we take multiple vessels and usually we do, do this at 30 days. Um, put your siphon in, go to another vessel and leave the, the sediment behind. So each time you do that, you can get more clarity. Does that make sense? We leave the sediment behind, get the fluid. And um, I usually like to do that at, at 30 days, um, first rack. That's also a good time if you want to add uh, fruit juice or anything else to your, your mead mixture because you have it open already. And you can uh, add that, ca uh, cap it up or sterilize, but you want to do the uh, rack at least once or maybe twice just to get some good clarity yes ma'am hey jim i forgot to ask you about how you wanted to handle questions but um um but i have a microphone so anybody who wants to ask a question i'll race over to you but here's a question so what are some popular you said that that's a good time to add juices or other flavors to your mead so what are some common things or flavors that people do add to their mead so um I like cranberry juice and pomegranate juice. Those are already, those are good flavors. And uh, you can add, add apple juice, you know, that'll make it something called a sizer. So there are many variations, you know, you can, you can experiment and ferment to your heart's content. But I, I personally do like the pomegranate and cranberry juices as a, as a uh, addition they're going to add more sugar into the into the mixture again, so they're going to have to go through another. They'll go through another spurt of of high uh, fermentation till they go to the end. So whatever juices you can think of or flavors you can try, you can try them. Okay, so racking. We talked about that. Okay, um, sterilization is a big a big deal. So we want to keep the uh, um, bad yeasts, bad organisms out of the mixture. So again, we, you know, we create that environment that's non-oxidizing. And um, if we do get something in there that it will make your mead taste wonky. <laughs> and maybe in old days, that's when they would add the fruit to kind of cover that up. But um, you want to sterilize every piece that comes in contact with your fluid, your air gaps, the siphons before you use it. And it's there's uh, some really easy sterilization um, things that you can use. You can get this mixture of bleach and water. I use a lot, of, you know, a little bit of bleach and water with a contact time for about two minutes. You know, just put your pieces in the bleach and water, let them sterilize. The other thing you can use these Camden tablets. This, when you see on your wines, it says contains sulfites. This is the substance they're talking about, the sodium meta bisulfite. Um, they come in tablets, so you can dissolve them in water, sterilize your equipment. Um, 
You can also, when we go through that racking procedure, and if you're adding um, fruit pieces, which I don't recommend doing because they float and come up and block your air gap, if you had a fruit piece and they're not like thoroughly cleaned, you can throw a tablet in into the must. So must is that term we use for the, the mixture before it's finished. So anything in the vessel, we call that must. You could throw a tablet in there and it will sterilize that a little bit. So, you know, th those are the things that, uh, that you need to do a basic meet, the materials. So um, I think, let's see if we go one more over. Okay, so we'll go back one. I'm just gonna, uh, now that we know all about the materials, I'll give you a little idea of the process. So um, what I like to do, if I'm gonna, uh, in this, I'm gonna get a, a volume of water, it's about half of this. So it's, it's hard to just pour honey in the funnel and get it to, to go down in and, and not be wasteful. But I will get about uh, half of the vessel in water, put it in a separate pan, get my honey, pour it out. Maybe I'll add a little bit of more water, shake it, you know, get it all into the pot, heat it just slightly so that it dissolves. Then you can take your funnel and that mixture and pour it in really easily. So it, it's a lot, it's quicker and easier, cleaner, I think. So you'll pour that in the vessel and you've got your, your basic uh, mixture. Um, the next part of the, you'll just simply take your yeast, open the packet, put it again in a small bowl, dump it in with some warm water. You might give it a stir or two and give it about three or four minutes and you'll start to see, if you start to see bubbling, that yeast is coming back to life. So it's um, ready to pitch into the must. So once you have that bubbling, you know, you just take your funnel again, add that to the mixture. You would take a stopper, give it a few swirls, and then grab your hydrometer and take that first reading. So you might float that, give it a little spin and look at the scale on the side as it floats and go, okay, uh, 15 and a half percent alcohol is a potential. So you note that little reading. Um, you might throw a dash of fermate in here. You don't have to, but it, it will speed the reaction up a little bit. Throw that dash in, uh, grab your airlock, put that on and let it go. The thing you want to do is like leave a little head space in here because the first, uh, I'm going to say first couple, three days, you're going to get this brown foam on top. They call it the Krausen. <laughs> it's the Krausen. It, but it'll build up and it will, if it's reacting real vigorously, it'll get up here in your airlock. It'll still work and it's okay. The airlock will still work. It, all the time, it's going to be bubbling like crazy. It's going to be maybe like, you know, just really fast. Over time, it'll slow down as there's less sugar to metabolize. So uh, you just um, sit there, get your popcorn, watch that bubble. I've, it's mesmerizing to me. I, you know, simple minds kind of like the, entertained easily. We'll put it that way. But at 30 days, um, if I'm, I'm going to rack at least once just for clarity. So it gets to 30 days and I'm going to take the air gap off. I'm going to get another vessel equal size. Put my siphon pump in, get the suction going and get uh, the fluid over and leave the sediment behind. So once I get the fluid transferred. I'm going to bring this back over and I'm going to go Let's put a little pomegranate juice in there, maybe some hot pepper, whatever it is, that garlic, whatever I want to put in there, you know, and I'll seal it back up, maybe give it a little swirl and then I'll, I'll walk away. And again, it's probably going to take, you know, 30, 40 more days if that's where I want it to finish at.
And I will just, you know, every day it's bubbling. But maybe I get to day 35 and there's, oh, there's no bubbles. You'll see the little meniscus in here will kind of level out. And you'll say, ah, I think it's done. But I want to be sure. So I'm going to remove the, the air gap, take my hydrometer, drop it in there, give it a spin, and see if it's down to zero. If it's down to zero, nearly so, you know, you might give it another day. And then you, you would call it finished. Jim, that was, so that was actually one of the questions on, um, one of the questions online was, um, so gravity has to be at a zero before bottling. Is that accurate? It should be. It yes. Should be. Okay. I know the, okay. the effervescence, effervescence of incomplete fermentations really, it does make the flavor a little better. Good you know, deal. a little champagne-y. Ah. And, and then, we'll have bottles like that occasionally, you know, where it's very close to done, but it's not completely done. Got it. And those are, those are really good. Oh, did you have a question? Oh, hold on. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so the recipe you gave, three pounds honey to one gallon of water. Per uh, gallon of total okay. product. Yeah. Um, does that zero out at 15%? I mean, your recipe does that? It depends on the yeast. So okay. um, yeast have different alcohol tolerances. So like that white wine yeast, it, it will finish at 15 and 15 and a half tops if it has enough sugar. If it's a champagne yeast, it'll go and it has enough fuel, you know, enough sugar in the vessel, it will go to 18% alcohol. So there's less residual sugar it's and that will produce a very dry a very dry uh mead oh yeah. one more question in the chat which was um let's see what kind when we talked about the type of juices that you use is it like bottled juices you get at the grocery store like ocean spray or what are you what kind of juices are you looking for yes yes to all oh okay <laughs> so anything yeah concentrated anything or it's you know, just has to have sugar. Yeah. So that's, that's the case. I'm not sure what kind of juice it wouldn't have sugar. <laughs> so you wouldn't want pu pure juice, pure juice. You'd want sugar juice. Um, no, well, pure juice has sugar in it. So it's glucose. Remember that reaction? It's not refined sugar. Refined sugar is a little more, it's not, it's the glucose in the sugar. So yes, you can use pure fruit juice. So if you have, you collect your blackberries and you throw them in the uh, smoothie maker, forgot what they're called, but you know, you just blend that all up, you get that juice, you strain it a little bit. And it's okay if it's not perfectly depulped, you know, because that's going to settle at the bottom. And again, at the end, you can rack it off, transfer it into another vessel or your bottles and leave the sediment behind. So yeah, you can you can use anything that you can juice, uh, smoothie up. That'll all work. So um, let's see. We'll go. Ah, bottling. So you get all done. It's finished up. You might have you know snuck a little taste, and it's oh I'm excited about this. Now I got to bottle it. So. We'll come back to your siphon pump. You know, you've cleaned it out in the interim and you drop it in the mixture and you get your siphon going. And, you know, with the little one, you just line up all your bottles, you know, below the, the vessel and you can just easily allow, fill a bottle, go to the next one, get them all filled up. This is all done. You've left the little, you've left the sediment and gunk at the bottom. It's all good. You get the, the right size corks to fit your bottles and you can use, uh, there's a few variations on the bottle, uh, but this is a very inexpensive two-handed lever action. Look, the cork in the uh, capping uh, corking tool 
And the, for uh, this simple one, you know, you just drop it in, put it on the bottle, boom, you got it, it corked. And then you just do all your bottles. Uh, the finished product, Will look like look like this. So this one, I didn't quite get it sealed down good, but it's not discolored. It's not leaking. Your extra wax that you've got from your solar melters, right? All got your huge wax cakes. You know, you just dip it in that pot, give it a turn. Got a nice decorative old school uh, seal, or you can use those plastic heat shrink tubes that. Uh, on most wine bottles, but that's a nice little old school touch. But um, you can just, you can cork them fine without uh, um, wax or seal. This They'll keep fine. This one's probably two, three years old. And you'll want to set it up right, you know, maybe for about a week, just to make sure, you know, it's not leaking. You may listen, ah, no. I don't hear a hiss, anything like that. And then they can go in the wine rack and you, you turn them periodically. I don't think mead, and I'm I'm unsophisticated palate here, but I don't think it improves greatly with age like, like wine can. And the Vikings, they never let it get past day 31. <laughs> you know, they would be digging it out of their bucket. Ah, school. But uh, that, that's what you'll end up when you've got it capped. And you can put your nice labels on there, make a beautiful product. And like I said, at our summer social, we made mead last winter. So in December, it was cold. It was difficult to start fermentation because um, you know our houses are a little cooler at that time. We did it, in a, we started it in a barn. So it was uh, probably on the, the 50, in the high 50s when that started. It took a while to, to ferment, but um, we ended up with some nice bottles that we'll have at our silent auction. So just, I, you didn't hear that from me. Erase that. So um, that, that, that's the, uh, the whole process. And, you know, normally at this point I would ask, you know, do you have any questions or comments? Oh, oh. oh yeah, here. The air the airlock that you use, right? Uh -huh. Are you taking the cap off when you use it? It goes in there and then you're taking the cap off so that it can release the air? Um this cap you mean? Yeah. Oh no, it has a gap in it. Okay. So it's just to keep sediment, you know, it's gonna take a while just to keep things from dropping in. Okay. But it's a, <laughs> yeah. Various debris from the that might settle there, but um, I'll hand this to you, but there's a gap for that allows gas to release. Okay. Okay. So I'll give you that. All right. So I wonder who else is gonna be making mead. <laughs> I, mean, does I know. It, does that seem like a- Does that sound like a good process? process to you? I mean, I could do this in like 20 minutes. You know, once you get used to doing it, you know what you're gonna add. You do it real quick, you know, and, Get everything out of the kitchen, off the floor before your wife comes home and <laughs> oh, yeah. and looks at you like, okay, you've already got a hundred bottles of that. Without the hydrometer, hydrometer, just by watching the bubbles, you could, you could, you know, you could watch that that meniscus in here and if you let it go a week and it hasn't bubbled you might feel pretty safe to bottle that that it will be done you might see that the meniscus rise up and and dip and fall because it the room warms up in the day and cools maybe a little at night and then at that point you know you give it a few extra days you're probably finished and that, what do you call that? A hyd hygrometer or something? Hy hydrometer. Hydrometer. Yes. Doesn't that measure the sugar? Yeah. Well, yeah. 
but it, mis it mi measures the gravity of the fluid. So depending on how much alcohol, water, sugar it has in it, has different density. So yeah, the, that will tell you the, the alcohol potential. There's three other scales on there too. I don't know if the winemakers, um, I forget what they are exactly. I have to get my readers out to read them. But yeah, there's three other scale, or two other scales on that one particular one. I think they usually come with three, three scales, percent alcohol. Um, now I forget what the other two pieces are. <laughs> I've had my readers, but yeah, the, all these things you find on Amazon really easily. So what was the um, start to, so the form, so I know you said it takes about 20 minutes to get it set up. And then what's the minimum to possibly maximum length of time again, that it, before it's finished? Before it's finished. I'd say the, the minimum times probably like 50 days. You know, if you do this in the summer and it's extra hot, that fuels that reaction. Reaction rate with more temperature goes quicker. In the winter, it may, because it's, you know, your house might be fluctuate, be a little cooler. You know, it, it may take up to 90 days. So that's why that, if you keep, if you have a nice controlled room, keep it 60, 70 degrees. I think in 60 days, you'll have a, a complete product. Minimum, I remember in the beginning, you said the minimum amount was three pounds of honey. That, and is that? Yes. So okay. you can vary that if it's some people do um, two gallon or two pounds per gallon, or some people might do more. It for me, and you can you can try this. You'll you'll see for yourself when you experiment with those um, those mixtures. I, I think I've heard of people doing it with like a pound and a half of honey per water. But then, so your potential fuel the amount of sugar and that's you know it's going to be half of that you know six percent or lower alcohol content and maybe that's what you want i don't know i haven't really tried one like that you know you can get meat in the store that's uh again this is a taxation uh equation for uh alcohol so <laughs> abc so there's a beer rate there's a beer tier for taxation there's a wine tier and then there's the, the hard, you know, the liquor taxation level. Some people will make meads below 6% six, 6 or lower just because they fall under a different taxation regulation tier. So you'll see those in stores too. And they probably started with less sugar. Oh, here we go. Okay, here's another one. Does the final product when bottling, is it usually clear or is it usually dark? And how long do you have to leave it in the bottle before it's ready to enjoy? I think I think you can enjoy it right away. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but is it usually clear or dark? Um, it's, I would say it's like amber and depending on the juice that you add, that adds a little tint to it. So like blackberry, dark juice. I don't know if you can because I have them in brown bottles. I wish I had a clear one, but it, it it's just just honey, yeast and water, no additives. It's like a very light uh, um, amber honey, same color. They're, it's yellowish. So I got to think of my honey scales. It, it you know, uh, light, it's not white. So it, it would be a little darker. Yeah. You know, what's interesting to me is that I, I recently got into doing sourdough starter and it's very similar to that it, to me, as far as like the temperature of the room and that kind of thing. And how, what's, what's interesting is that I bet every one of our meads would taste a little bit different. So we may actually, maybe next year we need to have a mead tasting contest. <laughs> <laughs> how many of you so how many of you are are really thinking about hey i'm gonna get some equipment and we're gonna do this yeah i know i think yeah i have my giant bottle that i bought from peter up in el dorado yeah so you'll need i'll need a five gallon carboy you'll need okay 
uh, 15 pounds of honey. I need 15 pounds of honey for that. So okay, I can do that. Under my, <laughs> under my recipe. I'm going to go talk to the bees. <laughs> yeah. So right, yeah, this is deal. why you need, this is probably why a lot of people don't ferment a lot of mead because it does take a lot of honey. But I always tell people, ah, no problem. I'm a beekeeper. I got the honey covered. So, and likewise, you guys, your three, 400 pound harvests this year, not a problem. Any other questions in the room? I know we'll get a chance to go up and look closely at Jim's items and, and, and also um, do some sampling. Um, so then let me check. So anybody... Anybody else in at home? I don't see any other questions that have come through on the chat at all, but this is like your last chance, I think. Um, I What I would like to do, Jim, if it's okay, so um, just some quick reminders. So we'll watch your email for your our next meeting in September. I cannot believe it's already September. Um, if you're not in the Facebook group already, please, please make sure that you join that because in the net for us in this area for the next 30 to 60 days is when most people are going to be harvesting their honey. So most people in this area seem to harvest around Labor Day, but give and take for me, it tends to be the middle of September for like Paul up in Galt. He's usually looking at in the next couple of weeks. So depending, remember beekeeping is local. So, so that may change for you guys. Um, so make sure to ask lots of questions. Don't wait for the next meeting. Um, the other thing that we wanted, so what I want to do though, is did everybody get a raffle ticket? Oh, okay. We had a couple of prizes come in. So I think what we're going to do is we're just going to make sure. So Jim, just so Jim knows too. So originally we wanted to generate more, more questions and answers during the meetings. And um, tonight's group was a little smaller, but but what we're going to do is in order, normally what we would do is in order to get a raffle ticket, you would have to write down a question that you brought with you so that we can help answer some of those during our meetings. But what we're going to do is just give everybody who's here a raffle ticket. So if you brought something, you obviously, you got something, you got an extra raffle ticket too. So for those at home, you guys, thanks so much for joining us. We're going to leave the camera on. Um, so you're welcome to hang out with us as long as you'd like. Um, but we, we're going to do is do our raffle and then we're going to, um, we're going to come up and, and take a look at some sample. <gasps> no, 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 you really, do you want to raffle? No, you do. <laughs> he wants to raffle one of his, <laughs> his bottles. Are you sure? Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's another one. You at home are missing out. <laughs> okay. All right. So, all right. I want a raffle ticket then. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you, Jim. That was so great. So for, thank you. Okay. Hang on to it. Um, so those of you at home, I'm going to sign off on the microphone. Um, we'll leave, uh, we'll turn off Jim's too. And, um, you're welcome to watch and hang out as long as you want, but everybody here will get to do the raffle and, uh, get to come up and look at the table of all the equipment and get some tapes. Does that sound good? All right. Very good.